All right, hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is the Decolonizing Education in Africa series, a multifaceted dialogue. We're gonna walk through the learning objectives or the objectives for the talk. So first our aim is to set the stage and understand what affected contemporary education systems in Africa, how we can understand the concept of decolonization within the realm of education and why it is crucial to have diverse perspectives. After that, we're gonna move on to the colonial legacy and educational systems that exist today and how they shape things in different African countries. We're gonna highlight the significance and of understanding the colonial legacy, legacy and understanding current challenges in education. Language and pedagogy is super important in the conversation. So we're gonna analyze the importance of language on learning outcomes in Africa. We're gonna explore the challenges and opportunities for implementing multilingual education. And we're gonna finish discussing ways to decolonize pedagogy to make it more inclusive and culturally relevant. As we move towards the end, we'll have a session on exploring decolonize, decolonizing institutions and leadership by addressing the changes needed at the institutional level and then identifying and advocating for change within institutions. We'll conclude by reimagining education for the future and by identifying future trends in education to support the decolonization movement, discuss innovative approaches to reimagine education in Africa, and how to empower individuals to contribute to the decolonization of education and their communities. There's a total of five sessions. We'll aim for about 20 minutes per session. After each session, we'll give a couple of minutes for questions from the audience, and then we'll move on to the next session. Right now, I wanna go ahead and introduce our two great panelists. Um, they come from some of the world's best institutions and they conduct some of the best work and work with the best organizations and they have a lot of experience in the context of Africa. First, we're gonna start out with Nana Afua Yaboa, PhD. She's a distinguished researcher and policy advisor based in the Washington DC metro area, specializing in education policy, immigration reform, and African and African diaspora studies. She holds a PhD from the University of Maryland College Park and leads diaspora praxis, a consultancy that leverages interdisciplinary research to deliver data-driven policy solutions. Nana's work profoundly addresses systemic violence and inequities affecting marginalized communities, particularly Black migrants. Her scholarship includes numerous publications on Black feminisms, transnational activism, and sociopolitical dynamics affecting African diaspora communities. Our respected speaker and a committed advocate, a respected speaker and committed advocate for civil and human rights, Nana is also heavily involved in service roles, contributing her expertise to various advisory boards and committees focused on public policy, data governance, and social justice. Thank you for joining us, um, Dr. Nana Afua Yaboa. Next, we have Professor Jesse Bump, who's the Executive Director of the Takemi Program in International Health and a lecturer on global health policy in the Department of Global Health and Population at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a member of the Bergen Center for Ethics and Priority Setting at the University of Bergen. He holds an A.B. in Astronomy and History from Amherst and a Ph.D. in the History of Science, Medicine and Technology from Johns Hopkins University, as well as an MPH from Harvard. The overarching goal of, of Professor Bump's research is to analyze the evolution of ideas and institutions that promote better societal performance. His work has focused on the special opportunities to build systems and advance social protections during and after widespread disruption. Using historical and political economic perspectives, Professor Bump investigates how and when societies develop ways to understand and manage the largest threats to lives and livelihoods. His multidisciplinary work leverages deep historical scholarship with social science theories and methods to produce strategies for the present and future. Thank you, Professor Jesse Bump for joining us as well. It's my pleasure. And so everyone is excited to get into the conversation. So we wanna go ahead and start with session one. Session one will be about setting the stage. So we'll start with the first foundational question what are some of the ways in which colonialism has shaped education systems in Africa? Mm 
Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you um, for hosting this space and for everyone joining and contributing to the conversation. I think when we think of this particular question that you're posing, um, we should think of ourselves in this post-colonial or decolonial period, having inherited what was a fundamentally underdeveloped educational system. Um, in particular, when we talk about the implementation of formal colonial educational policy that comes towards the tail end of the colonial period, whereas the missionary enterprise was more so and had a wider range and a longer history of education throughout the African continent and context. Um, and when I say underdeveloped, I mean that what we inherited was inevitably um, underfinanced. There was a variation in opportunities on the basis of where you, uh, schools were positioned and based. And a lot of that had more to do with um, regions that were most profitable to the empire as opposed to overall needs for the population. Um, a lot of historic studies, and I, I often tell people um, one of the best studies, I think, of the colonial educational um, sort of experience in history is Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It speaks to just overall lack of quality in schooling, dropout rates, which some of the most, I would say, conservative I've seen in terms of colonial education were like at, as low as 40 to 50 percent. Um, so there's a lot, I think, in terms of just structural inefficiencies and inequities and quality issues that we've inherited and sort of see that persist to date. Um, there are issues in terms of curriculum as well, in terms of language and determining what is the sort of medium or language of instruction, which is continues to be a debate across, across countries. Um, there's so much I think that I could go into further, but I sort of wanted to start there and then sort of also give space for Dr. Bump to also provide his answers or thoughts as well. All right, thank you, Professor Bump. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nana. I, I it, This is a hard question to answer in the sense of there's nothing that's not influenced by colonialism. So look, the knowledge system itself, like all of Western knowledge comes out of this epistemic tradition of reproducibility and witnessing. And at the beginning, witnessing could only be done by a gentleman. Experiments could only be done by a gentleman. So if you weren't an upper class Englishman, you just couldn't do it. You couldn't create knowledge. Anything you knew wasn't knowledge. And you couldn't be part of the validation process. So even on that really basic, most fundamental epistemic level, the definition of what knowledge is and how it gets manufactured is colonial. It's anti-African. It's anti-Black. It's anti-woman. It's like anti-everything that's not upper-class English. And even though you can study things that aren't upper-class English, it makes it more difficult. So in the, in the first sense, if you think about knowledge creation in the Western tradition, where you try to minimize the observer and maximize reproducibility. Well, let's say we go into a racialized environment. Nana goes first. Something happens. I go second. Doesn't happen. Or something doesn't happen, then something does happen. You know, either way, we got a null finding, right? We just well, don't know because the observer doesn't matter. Now, obviously, you can get more sophisticated than that and you can try, but this bias about how knowledge gets created and who can create it, you see very widely. So look at data used for education now. Where did it come from? Who owns it? Who generated it? Who said it was knowledge? It's all coming out of the Western tradition. African knowledge systems, you know, they led the world at various points, just like in any other region of the world. You know, the, the, over in Tanzania, there were blast furnaces thousands of years ago, first flush toilets or water sanitation systems, Egypt. You can make a long list of Africa first, and of course, all humanity comes from Africa. But what the colonizers did was they, what I call is the colonization of zero. They took the standard and they made it theirs. So none of that mattered. None of those traditions survived in the colonial period. Yes, they have persisted and many brave people have preserved them and have tried to sustain the flame, but colonizers did their best to destroy it. They tried to redefine knowledge around the things that they could do and the things that they wanted to do. So what counts as knowledge and who gets to make it 
It's all colonizer centric. They destroyed the older educational systems and they established the state as the center of information. So, I mean, think of my discipline, history or epistemology, where do you start? Usually with a written record, that's usually better than anything else. And who generates the most paper records? It's the state. So if you're not visible to the state, then you don't count. Then your ideas don't count. Then like even you don't exist. If you think about a vital registration system, can you get a passport? If not, you don't exist. You can't get rights. So to move from that discussion closer to what you said about education, well, the entire enterprise aims in the wrong direction. And let's just say, okay, we'll start in the colonial period. Well, economic policy was run from the metropoles. Social policy was always run from the colony. And the colony had to pay both the extractive stuff itself, the toll of colonialism, the murder, the rape, the burden, and taxation from within paid for education. So it's not just you can't have your own education. You're going to pay us to deliver ours. So, for example, in, in Ghana, one thing that happened was that the at Gold Coast at the time, but Ghanaians were going to the colleges of the Black Power movement in the 1920s and 30s. And the English didn't want that. They wanted to control the message. That's why they started to expand state-based colonial education. So from this starting point, right, you have a state and you have an educational system, both of which are designed to contain information and steal from the indigenous people. Like you're just going in the wrong direction. So everything that you could do in there is suspect. It doesn't mean everything is wrong, but it means your foundation, it's not a good one. It's not a good one. And in the in reverse perspective, just you know, say like someone with autonomy, an independent country, they take ideas from elsewhere all the time. You know, they taste uh, something good, start making it for themselves, or they see a good idea like a wheelbarrow from China. You use it. Ice cream, also from China, hey, great idea. Noodles from China, great idea. Or traditional foods like a potato or something from South America. You know, things that have indigenous people have created. People, like, they see that, they take it, they copy it. It's a normal inflow, knowledge, exchange, people, migration. You can't do that in the colonial period. So the good parts of Western knowledge or allopathic medicine that Africans might have taken for themselves and integrated into systems that made sense for them, that can't happen. It can't happen in the colonial period. So the wholesale replacement of one culture's knowledge system by another's means there's all these incompatibilities. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, do you speak two languages? Or if you know anyone who speaks two or more languages, you know there's things that make sense in one that just don't make sense in another. There's things that you do, and then there's things that you do over here. Some overlap, but there's always these distinct parts. And you have to be from there with that language, with that culture to understand. And a knowledge system is the same way. So you definitely import the ideas that make sense, the institutions that make sense, the resources that make sense. But in the colonial context, having many of the people killed, many of the people oppressed, knowledge systems destroyed, institutions destroyed, and then having all that wholesale replaced by somebody else's ideas that you have to pay for with enslaved labor is like, that's a non-starter. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work out. You're never going to catch up. Even if there's some good parts inside, that's the wrong starting point. Absolutely. And even the good parts inside, there wasn't much put in place, implemented in terms of structurally enforcing and making that a reality. Um, I really enjoyed the comments that you've made. And I also think it's important to also take it to the text of the colonial policies for education in itself. Because I found just in my experience sometimes too, that's removed because there was a very clear agenda. Um, for instance, in 1925, the Adv Advisory Committee on Native Education in British Tropical African Dependencies lays out that the first task of education is to raise the standard alike of character and efficiency of the bulk of people. It this embeds like, and this comes from language that you'll even see in the 1885 Berlin Act, which charges and says that 
these colonial powers are now in charge of the civilization or bringing these natives to civilization, actual language that's used throughout the policy, right? Um, and also naming like as re resources permit the door of advancement through higher education in Africa must be increasingly open for those who by character, ability and temperament show themselves fitted to profit by such education. So also once again, there's a deeply capitalistic nature to the education that was put into place. This was about what you could produce, what you could produce for the empire and what sort of and to what extent um, and largely sort of meant to sort of maintain what was a larger colonial, oppressive, racist, um, racist relationship experiences that bleeds over into curriculum. A lot of what sort of motivated my work into learning more about these colonial educational experiences is actually just being raised by two survivors of colonial schooling, who oftentimes would not frame themselves as such, but the experiences that they would relay and the sort of impact it had around their socialization around schooling, education, knowledge was deeply traumatic. Um, I had the opportunity to, um, while I was a research fellow at the Schomburg Center, go through some of the texts, for instance, that students would be made to read, to ingest, to then say was truth, was right. And I have a, a quote here that I wanted to share as well. Um, this is from a text that was written by the first superintendent, um, then super senior superintendent of education in Nigeria for about close to two decades. Um, this is Tropical Africa and World History. Thus it is only among a civilized people that we can expect, for example, inven inventions as printing and the steam engine and the discovery of the uses of electricity. All such things which are products of civilization in turn help people become more civilized. Men who live apart in small groups and regard all other people as foreigners are therefore called uncivilized. It is usually found that uncivilized people have little knowledge and few inventions compared with civilized people. European civilization is now having an effect on many backward African tribes, which are accepting some of its advantages. And this is in 1938. And students would have been expected to say this, to know this as truth, although it's not truth. There's always dual duality that exists within these experiences. And even, you know, as we see student movements progress throughout, um, there's a large objection and dissent to what's being taught and what is regarded as knowledge, but everything really was deeply traumatic, deeply wrong. In particular, as we think in present day, I, I shudder to think how the remnants of a lot of what happened is largely unaddressed. It was sort of meant to sort of move on as opposed to sitting and rectifying just the deeper sort of effects of what happened for centuries. Yes, thank you. Um, those are some great responses, and they leaded me to ask a question. We talk a lot about the state and the importance of this and the things they implemented within African countries, but one question I have is what other institutions were responsible for implementing this kind of system? Because if we look at you know world society and modernism, the Western world has created this kind of ethos that we all kind of act under, this world culture that we act under. And so what other institutions at different levels of unit are responsible? So at the organizational level, the intergovernmental level, um, the, uh, you know, the business or the organizational level, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question quite right but if you mean what are the sort of institutional pressures that shape education policy or educational experiences in a colonial context there's several you know there's the, sure. the private sector there's the government and the military and there's the church systems exactly. so those are things that the colonizers brought and don't 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 take that to mean that's the only education going on. It's not. So what I mean is the colonizers tried to influence education and build education through those mechanisms. So the missionaries, they would do it for their purposes, often often in, in conversation with the colonial state. That depends on the colonizer in the place and the exact strength or the coordination of it. That depends on what kind of church it was. But whether it was centrally coordinated, like, you know, in the 
former, uh, where the Belgians were in the now democratic Congo, the Catholic church is like a stronger, more centralized network. The Anglican slightly more diffuse, but you know, the, the one kind of education is, is coming through there. And as Nana was saying, like the objective of that education is there's really two of all of these things. There's only really two objectives. One of them is to make theft, extraction, domination more efficient. So that knowledge gets created and like it's around compliance or around how do you get gold out or how do you dig things or how do you sort and sift. And this isn't, I'm not dividing this by knowledge for Africans and knowledge for Europeans. Of course, the perpetrators would want most of that sort of extractive technical knowledge for themselves. But that kind of knowledge is how do you make this colonial, capitalistic, racialized theft more efficient? You generate knowledge for that, including health knowledge. Like how do you get white people to survive? How do you limit the uh, spread of sleeping sickness when you're sending people in to uh, collect rubber and ivory in sleeping sickness areas? When you're disturbing the entire ecology to extract resources, you have many health problems. So that kind, that's one kind. The other kind is justifications. So it makes the colonial project sound better, sound more acceptable. And it's intended for both the indigenous people to make them agree, like, hey, colonization is great. You're secondary, but you know, you deserve it and you'll be better under us. And, you know, just a bunch of lies like that mixed in with, you know, I don't know, maybe a couple of things that you could say are true at some point or other, but disambiguating what is, is right and, and wrong is it's like, no, you know, in the middle of a murder. If someone stops to wipe up a spill, it's like that, that's that's just not in the balance. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. So that second kind of knowledge about justification is designed to placate indigenous people and metropolitan protesters. So every time you find a crime in history, anything big scale, you'll find the group that does it, a group that doesn't care, and a group that opposes it. In colonialism, well, the group that wanted it, they won. And I'd say they're still winning. But it's the abolitionists, right? They end slavery and colonialism is after that. So there's always this contest, even in the metropole, about what is the right role here? You know, how are we, are, should we be doing this? And some people are saying, no, we shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. And other people are like, it's our right. The people who wanted to do it, they won. But this kind of knowledge to justify is designed to tip that balance in favor of extraction of that hierarchy, that social order. So those are the two kinds of knowledge. And then if you're asking me, it doesn't really matter which channel it's moving from. The channel might change the balance a little bit. It changes the content. It changes the actors. But that is the stratospheric two purposes. And I think those are the only two. Those, those, are, those are where you're going to find knowledge that's, I mean, to make it more efficient, it also includes stealing things like biopiracy. It means like taking knowledge that indigenous people have and then commercializing it for yourselves. Right. That, there's an old tradition of that too. But th that's how I'd answer your question. Okay. Yes. I think you um, answered it in the way I intended it to be answered. So oh, good. sorry if it was a little bit confusing. Um, we do need to move on to the next session. So, Dr. Yaboa, I wanted to ask, is there any comments you wanted to put for this first question before we conclude for the first session? Well, that's fine. We can continue on. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, there were a couple of finalizing questions for this session. Um, you know, what how what can we how can we understand the concept of decolonization within education? And why is it crucial to incorporate diverse perspectives, especially in the case of Africa? So if we could have a couple, two minute summaries from both of you, that way we can move to the next session. That way we can stay on time. Okay, for time's sake, I think how we should understand decolonization should definitely be as a multi-pronged 
long-term process, considering that this was uh, centuries old in the making. Um, and it's not something that generally, it's not to stop, it's ongoing. It's a continu It really revolves deep interrogation and interventions into curriculum, into pedagogy, into who are the actors that contribute actively to shaping educational policies, practices, programs. It's something that has to also be deeply ingrained in community and in sort of thinking through needs of various communities and populations, in particular, those who are excluded. Um, in particular, within the African context, that means marginalized genders, that means marginalized ethnicities, that means people from different religious backgrounds who may have been removed from our understandings of what education should and look like and function for. Um, our communities and our countries wide scale. And I think that's sort of what's in that leans into, or it leans into why it is significant to incorporate diverse perspectives. We actually need everybody's voices. We need to know and understand the experiences had within the schooling context to think through ways to create something better, more human, humane, humanistic, something that centers the whole um, in terms of African children and youth, as opposed to what has been known traditionally colonially to present, um, which is just a focus on achievement and production. Thank you. And then Jesse as well, any final comments? Yeah, so Nana gave great answer. Did you mean like, how do you decolonize education in Africa by Africans and for Africans or about Africa elsewhere? Um, More of the former. Oh, well, you know, just support independence and autonomy, send resources and leave them alone. This mess can't be sorted out by outsiders and it will not easily be solved by insiders. You know, there's no such homogenization to say that all Africans this or that, other than saying things like basic rights and entitlements, some collaborated, some opposed, some liked it, some benefited, most didn't, but how should that be sorted out? Only through a domestic political process. So I'd say it's like, send money, restore resources, send objects, send everything back that you can, pay reparations, let people sort it out for themselves. All right, thank you. I appreciate that answer. Um, there is one really quick question I'd like to ask. Um, Nana is an expert in diasporic studies, and so I wanted to ask, what role would Africans in the diaspora play in helping with the educate or decolonizing the education system in Africa? That is a great question. I think all of us, I think more than anything, this would be a collaborative process. We are all in our own ways decolonizing and navigating and managing our own decolonial efforts across educational systems, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in the Caribbean, I've done extensive work that focus on the Caribbean as well, or even in the United States. Um, I think there's a lot that we learn from each other in particular in sort of shared learning spaces historically to present, um, whether that be like at sites like HBCUs, which are complex. I've attended one myself, complicated, but have also had a, a great sort of presence and role in educational conversations, development, thinking, training, across the diaspora and the continent. But I think more than anything, this is a time for us to learn and support each other's efforts uh, to exchange methods, to exchange ideas and thoughts, uh, not so much as a sort of role and that's one is coming to save or help or change the other. Uh, I think we're all actually in this current period in time learning more about each other's histories as well, which aids sort of the decolonization of um, work in itself because through the colonial educational effort, we learn things about each other based in stereotypes, based in harmful, racist ideologies, pseudoscience. And we continue to see even like, you know, like even across diaspora wars, right? On uh, social media, such and so on and so forth, a constant learning and unlearning that I think is just integral and essential to this decolonization project. And so definitely lending into coalition and solidarity building within the educational ex um, efforts is where I think we're at. All right, thank you. Yes, that definitely is true. Um, really quick before we move to session two, um, Hugh or Tim, do you have any questions for either of the, either of the panelists? This is no question. 
Thank you so much. All right, so it looks like there's no questions. So we will move to the second session. So the second session will focus on colonial legacy and educational systems. So we're gonna explore how colonial policies have shaped education systems in African countries today, discuss the lasting effects of colonialism on education in Africa today, and then highlight the significance of understanding the legacy and addressing challenges in education. So the first foundational question we'll ask to our panelists is, how did colonial policies impact the structure and content of education in different African countries? We did touch a little bit on this in session one, but we'll tailor our responses, you know, specifically to the question. Okay, just so, I guess, sort of to some then to, and as we discussed prior, like prior to European presence across, or prior to European presence and colonization of Africa, indigenous educational philosophies and practices and systems, all of these things existed. With colonization, this shifted education in terms of agenda, institutions, policies, practices, systems, finance, aligned with the needs and desired outcomes of European and colonial powers. Um, within that educational effort, in particular with the policies put in place, a central component uh, was the use of formal and popular education as a tool of Christianization, subjugation, assimilation to meeting larger labor and political needs and agenda of the empire. Um, and we've also talked briefly about this, but um, the missionary education enterprise functioned within its own self and had its own mechanisms, but there are ways in which we see within policy that there was also a protection um, of Christian missionaries, scientists, and explorers alike who were working within the continent within educational reasons and for those types of purposes. But that's just a sort of summing it up. Like this completely, this completely shifted things in a way that did not account for the needs um, and also the real sort of structural and systemic needs um, of implementing education um, that was now sort of stepped into a place of a new golden standard that was directly aligned with European Eurocentric thinking and thoughts. I mean, just to, to step in on, on, on the back of a basically a complete answer from Nana, I'll step up a level just to give you something in addition to what she said. And that's like, how is it not colonial? Look at the languages. What's the language of instruction? What's the concept? Like local versus international? It's like, you know, everything about education is shaped by that external domination. And it hasn't been fully rethought. So if you go to the period before Europeans made such a mess, it would be a, a complete functioning society. Schools, courts, governments, food systems, agricultural systems, belief systems, religions, like real societies. Like don't think it's like a couple of people sitting around with a drum or something. No, these are some of the civilizations, the oldest civilizations we have, some of the most knowledgeable and most accomplished civilizations the world has ever known. Other groups came in with more military power and they just destroyed it. So wiping all that away, crushing that, trying to hide it, it creates a problem for trying to reconstruct what was there. How do you tell a history without documents if you killed everybody, oral history runs out. If you change the environment, then foods, medical systems, ways of life become impossible. If you poison the oceans, the fishes disappear. Also, if you take them all, and you know, if you look at the names of things, even now, like names in countries of Africa, it's names for stuff that people stole. Gold Coast, Ivory Coast, Cameroon, I mean, that's camarones from shrimp in Spanish or Portuguese, right? They called it the Grain Coast, the Ivory Coast, the Slave Coast. Everything about it, it's just this, it's so completely dominated 
that the rethinking hasn't yet happened at a deep enough level. The, the lighter levels, right? It's, okay, we're going to use your language and your ideas to say that you guys are bastards. Okay, yeah, that's a good first step. But you really need your own language to say what was done. You need your own people to say what that experience was. Now, if you want to go find a history of Africa, guess who wrote it? You know, just go to Google. Like, who who defined what's on the internet? It's the people who got there first. There are just a lot more non-Africans who have been in a position to get educated and to write stuff and to put their views out there. So the sort of atmospheric, ethereal level evidence base in the world, it's already dominated by one particular perspective or a couple. So you would really struggle to find any aspect of our world, never mind the educational system in Africa, you'd really struggle to find any aspect that hasn't been touched. If you're breathing, you're breathing colonial air. So rethinking about how to purify that that's a very, very fundamental activity. And I'm I'm not aware that that's been allowed to happen. Like, where are the resources for that? I mean, I go to, a, I mean, I teach at a great university. I don't speak for it anyway, but, you know, Harvard is great. Why is Boston rich? Well, you know, sugar from the Caribbean. Produced by enslaved labor. They made it into rum. Like, you just get first little advantages and then like cotton from the south produced by slaves and then resources start coming together and you have something to grow an enormous and successful educational institution but if you don't have those resources you know in harvard's case there's a 400 year head start if you begin now so i, I think this would take a systematic rethinking led by indigenous people led by africans with resources that ought to be contributed by everybody else. So I, I, I would just add that to her, her more practical answer. I hope mine is, becomes practical, but that's a that's the big scale. It's a big task. We need the two. We need the practical yeah. and the larger, the, the theoretic, because it's as you say, and and there are, there needs to, I mean, I think that we see different spaces across, thanks to different coalitions, scholars like yourself, different people who are creating space to have these conversations, but seeing it a larger systemic across, that's going to take a lot of time, but definitely time needed because these are grievances that have always also been documented um, in terms of what was happening, what students are experiencing, what colonialism is doing and has done. You know, I always do, go back to and think of Walter Rodney's quote, uh, the only positive development in colonialism was when it ended. And I 100% agree um, because we continue to sort of see and navigate through my goodness, which was a large, a massive disrupting event, traumatic event that we continue to sort of like, this is going to take years and years, decades, centuries to figure out how best to rectify. Yes, thank you for both of those responses. Um, I guess a question I'd like to ask is what did education look like before colonialism? So here in the Western world, you know, we have like a hierarchy. We have all these degrees and people see you as an authority based on where you place in degrees. Um, we have like universities versus high schools where there are more blended settings where we had a larger range, range of ages learning together. Do they have a different hierarchy system for education? Um, what subjects did they prioritize over the ones we prioritize in the colonial system of education, what did it look like, you know, pre-colonization? That is a really great question, and it's a big question. Things would have looked different across societies um, and would have been unique to those societies, but we still sort of see there are histories. There's a, um, I shared a link to different like readings for people to um, sort of review in terms of research that's been done previously, but there were certainly, I, there was from early to what we consider early childhood care to higher education, these things did exist across the continent. Uh, there were different systems of knowledge, of documenting that knowledge, whether it was oral, there are a few that were sort of pictorial as well. Um, 
there were initiation rights that were specific based on gender, things for children, for or education for boy children, for girl children. Um, one of Kwame Nkrumah's earliest writings about education in the Gold Coast focused on that, what education for boy versus girl children within his ethnicity looked like. Um, but it's a massive, there were, there were, I mean, from technical to what would have been musical to what have been like focused on governance types of educational focuses. Like there were, so, there was so much in an abundance in place as we know, and has been recorded by in particular African historians and scholars working to revive that legacy because there was an intentional effort on the European end to also destroy a lot of the artifacts and a lot of the work that had been done to capture what was knowledge and education across the continent but it was massive. It spoke to the needs of the society. It spoke to also agricultural and food system needs as well. Um, it also spoke to like folk, folk and cultural retention and remission as well. Um, I think that was one of the core of this, of, of educational systems across African societies, but very massive, um, very intentional as well. It's not as if Europeans stepped into something that didn't, or stepped into sort of spaces that didn't have things functioning. It was just very different. And also we were in the time of what was racism, right? This was the, the beginning, this was a justification for, like this is very different, very black, very African, very backward, uh, which you heard in the language that I used in one of the policy documents prior. But yeah, there was a lot that existed, very rich, very diverse, very beautiful. Um, some things I think you could argue have been sort of retained in very secret ways, secret societies that we don't often engage in as well as a particular particular education in terms of initiations, but very much existed and was present and thriving. Thank you for the insights. That definitely helps uh, set the stage for what we should be expecting. Um, and the next couple of questions, this or in the next few sessions, we'll talk about what it looks like to move back towards that. We have a couple of uh, more foundational questions for this session. So the second is, what are some of the lasting effects of colonialism on Africa today? Ooh. Man. Like, you know, there's been mechanized, systematic, government-sponsored theft and murder for 150, 200 years, and then slavery before that. Like, think of the millions of people. Think of the trillions of dollars of minerals, ivory, rubber, tin, bauxite, cobalt. It's still going out now. I mean, if you have a phone in your pocket, then you have a colonial companion. Those miners in the Congo, the Congolese, they're not getting a fair wage for that. None of the mining companies treat the countries well. All of the mining companies come from the colonial period. Like and they make contracts with themselves. That is, with the colonial government when it was run by those people. And then those were grandfathered into trade agreements. So trying to regain control of minerals, of natural resources, never mind trying to make up for all the lives lost. Like, Kwame Nkrumah wrote his book on neocolonialism shortly after Ghana's independence in 1957. So just a few years later, he wrote that book to say, we had this thing called independence and we were happy, but we didn't get it. Mm -hmm. The political colonization just got fully supplanted, fully replaced and enforced by economic means. So he wrote, you know, and this is now 60 years ago, we're not free. And what's changed since then? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about that. Like, this is not a good starting point. This is, you know, it's it's not a place where we could say, well, we've made a lot of good progress. Have Europeans said they were sorry? No. 
have the multilateral corporations, multinational corporations, have they like given themselves up or redistributed or democratized their boards? Like, no. Has the business community, you know, European consumerism is built on African labor and African inputs, right? So did they give it back? Did they talk about it? Like, you got to do that stuff. Education, educational policy, and those are those are like little things. This is like a whole of society. This is a planetary thing. You got to start with that. So restore the resources, restore, acknowledge the crimes, give some dignity, allow people to reclaim their stories, get out of the way. Like those are those are the steps. Let them heal. Then they can think about what education they want. And it isn't necessarily that they would go back to what was before because the world has moved on. What was then didn't grow, wasn't allowed to develop. So Africans for themselves will need to decide who they are and what they want to do when they're finally restored to equal footing in this world. When they claim for themselves the rights, the resources, the dignity, the history, all of it's theirs, and they need it back. So you get that, then they decide whatever they want to do. And That's we need to get back to the place of having these types of conversations. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I do agree wholeheartedly with that. And there are so many ways in which African students and youth throughout, especially the colonial period, actually named that this was not what they wanted. They wanted something different. Um, and understood that the world had now moved on to a new standard, but still there should be some dignity in how they are treated and how education functions. Um, I know I've been using quotes, but I just love them because I don't think we hear enough African voices. Um, the West African Student Union was that, based in London, uh, based in the United Kingdom. And in 1945, they published a magazine. Um, and it was on the second page. It was from the entire sort of board of editors. And they said here, the life of an average student is supposed to be one of a happy-go-lucky irresponsibility. Not so that of a West African student whose circumstances have tricked into placing his destiny under the absolute control of an external power. As soon as a West African student sets his foot on the soil of England, he is willy-nilly forced into position of assuming the role of what might have been termed an introvert controvert. He must, if he has any national pride at all, defend without being bitter the sanctity, integrity, and honor of his native country and her ancient institutions against the onslaught of pseudoscientists and self-appointed colonial experts whose pens are being devoted towards driving a wedge between Great Britain and the peoples of West Africa. Like this is on the, the third page of a student magazine in 1945. And we can't say that we've actually moved that much even when we talk of and people say like brain drain, there would always have been a brain drain. There was a purposeful underdevelopment. There was a first canceling out of African higher educational traditions and then saying, if you are to get educated, we're going to even limit how you are able to get to the Americas. We want you in the metropole because your knowledge is to be gained here under our eyes, under our surveillance. Like this is very serious stuff that happened and there's never been an apology. There's never been an admission of how this has, I mean, significantly damaged um, how we understand education, how we understand ourselves as a people. To tell children and children to then grow up as adults knowing that they were told that they were nothing there's never been a space to address this. And that is so dangerous. That is so dangerous. There are people walking around today who carry that, who then take on positions, who've taken on positions that have caused great harm. Some of the times not even understanding the deeper so social, psychological, even spiritual abuses that they experienced in the schooling experience and how that shaped how they became as professionals. There's so much to be addressed. Um, and for a long time, the youth most impacted by this have been saying it. There was a time in which they were leading movements. They still continue to lead movements. There was time where we were saying that there's a need to decol decolonize curriculum. And that happened for a time until 70s and 80s 
happen, until structural adjustment policies happen, until there's shifts in terms of governance, in terms of emergencies and crises. But this is very significant. We have to talk, we have to pause and we have to think through, well, how do we want to train and educate African child and African youth? Because for a long, long time, we have not had that dialogue intentionally. We're just moving along within the larger educational rat race of the world. Yes, thank you for adding that. And there's a couple of comments I wanted to make. You discussed the brain drain and kind of the reduction in legitimacy and the African education and the kind of things we want to be educated in. When you, I've spent a lot of time in Zambia and Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire and then Cameroon and a couple of other countries. And it even kind of constrains the kind of subjects that African students studies, which reinforces like this kind of change in culture and change in idea. And so in the continent, you'll usually see in a lot of places, people stick to STEM subjects or ones that they believe will give them a career to make a lot of money. Or you see another bias towards ones that are very social, you know, like social change oriented, like international relations or something like that. You don't see a large focus on art or music or culture or the liberal arts, which contributes significantly to society and cultural development. Um, those are even, even in the Western or colonized, or even in the colonizers countries, those are seen as important, but there's kind of like a fight against them now. And there's a fight against them in African countries as well, which reinforces the system and kind of the culture and the way that things changed. Exactly. Exactly. And then also one thing you mentioned about the way that African students see themselves under this colonized system we also have the idea of imposter syndrome. And so I've spent a lot of time in Cameroon and I've seen a lot of students and they're just as talented as students from the rest of the world, even in the STEM subjects and everything else. Um, we tend to think that because they don't have a big you know, university lab and they don't have these big elite MacBook computers that they can't do work, but in reality, they're just as talented, but they have that kind of imposter syndrome. And they don't have the tools in order to mobilize their education the same way that people can, like outside of a colonized situation. Um, and there's not an ease of doing business for them. There's not as many, you know, employment opportunities afterwards. And these are all affected by colonization and put pressure on how education unfolds in Africa. Exactly, exactly. There has to be some introspective work as well, because, yeah, there's an evaluation of particular degrees and certifications and things um, that we also hold dear. And that just has a lot to do with not having engaged deeply in that work. Like, you know, even if you, you know, like, I think just significant. I really appreciate this point. I really appreciate your point. I don't want to take up too much time. We can move on to the next questions. Thank you. Yes, um, we are moving a little bit slow on time. So we have one more question in this session. Um, we can wrap up with a couple of short uh, comments from both of you, but how can understanding the colonial legacy help us address current challenges in education? Mm. Just for a few, I guess, few short comments, I think understanding the legacies and impacts of colonial education is significant in A, that it gives us a chance to pause and recognize our humanity and say what happened to us was not okay. It's not justified. It was completely wrong, inadequate, actually in a number of ways quite wicked um, in terms of the experiences that people had within these spaces. And I think that's necessary for us just in terms of our humanity. Like it is okay for us to pause and say after 500 centuries, hey, what happened, that is actually, that's violent. It is very violent to treat people like this, treat children like this. Um, there's a video that I've even shared in, in terms of those archival videos. You actually see children building their own schoolhouse and then being then pulled aside for lessons. This is abhorrent, like this is grotesque. 
So we need to take that pause, right? I think also creating space to acknowledge, identify, and really intervene on remnants of colonial legacy is very important in particular when we think of just immediately what punishment looks like in schools across Africa, what history and social, social studies curriculums look like, academic standards and competition and what that looks like. Um, I think it gives us a, like a real chance to interrogate and change how we approach education and also gives us a space to support and really amplify the work, the analyses and the efforts of African educationalists um, who have been driving conversations and who have theories, who have thoughts and practices um, that need to be incorporated within curriculum and need to be valued, I think, across education departments, across um, programs and policies and truly centered, as opposed to sort of the focus of competition with the West. I think this gives us a time to truly, like, what is development? What is development and progress for us as Africans without focusing sort of on the outside? Yes, thank you. I think that's a perfect response. And um, yeah. Jesse, yeah. do you have any finishing comments? A great response. I, I just add that colonialism has to be decentered. So it's not a good place to start talking about the future of education in Africa by looking at colonialism. I mean, that may be the biggest influence right now, but it shouldn't be the guiding force, right? The future isn't just not that. The future is what Africans want. What do people want? What do they want for themselves? What do they think is right next? So as a historian, I do, I'm very sympathetic. I do like analyses that look at the past and its impact on the present. That's important for understanding harms and healing. But to go forward, you need to not think about what the Europeans did. Forget them. Think about what Africans want. Then take from them the things that are useful, if any, and go ahead. But this has to be like Africans in the middle. And they can ask anyone else they want for help. Other people just need to support that, to have some respect for 600 years of theft, extraction, genocide, slavery. Just have some respect for that by stepping back and saying, well, our people have created problems that we can't solve. You know, guy comes into your house, starts stealing things, breaks a vase. Do you really want him to stop and put it back together? It's not. Just Africans need to be in the middle. They need to decide for themselves. Yes, thank you for that. All right, that was a really good end to session two. Um, we got a lot in. Um, from two of our attendees, would you like to ask any questions to the two panelists before we move on? Please keep going. No. Okay, thank you. So now we'll move on to session three. This focuses on language and pedagogy. So our objectives are to analyze the impact of language on learning outcomes in Africa, to identify challenges and opportunities for implementing multilingual education, and then finally to discuss ways to decolonize pedagogy to make it more inclusive and culturally relevant. So our first foundational question will be, how does language impact the learning outcome of students in Africa? We did mention this a little bit before, but let's focus on it a little bit more specifically. I'm going to answer, I was gonna provide a, like say a brief answer, but I just also wanted to make sure we were being joined by others. Um, oh, this is um this is all that'll be joining today. Okay. I was mainly prepared for session two um in terms of preparation, 
the first two sessions, but I will say in terms of speaking to language on learning outcomes in Africa, um, this is also a number, a larger conversation, I think, embedded in that comes from the colonial period in that the shift and focus of the language or languages of instruction have been European languages, aside from the fact that there are several, in some countries, hundreds of languages across different ethnic groups. Um, this often causes and has caused to date different conversations around language policy and what best to implement for students and youth in terms of like bi and multilingual curriculums, how best to implement these things. Um, because there is an impact in terms of learning, in terms of how you're able to succeed, in particular when you're using your first language, your mother tongue, um, and also adding in efforts in which you're able to learn others. But the mother tongue has not been the one that's been centered across different uh, across different countries throughout the continent since the colonial period. So there's ongoing sort of policy and debate on how best to address and implement within a policy way, um, multiple ways of learning across languages. I mean, those are great points. Um, the only thing I'd, I'd like to add to it is to emphasize how important language is to knowledge. It's incredibly central. So when you switch languages, you switch knowledge as well. Not all of it necessarily, and it depends on the proximity of languages, but the things that you can do in one are different in some areas from what you would do in another. And the dominance of English for so long has changed the evidence base. So as you look forward to AI, like what's happening with AI is it's it's based on scraping the internet. So whose stuff is on the internet? Well, you know, almost all the internet content is created by very few, very limited groups of people. I mean, within the tech industry, there's very, very, very little democratization. So it's over 90% white and male. So, you know, if you have AI that's based on things that that group likes and does for itself, then the AI is going to think like that. And that's another re-marginalization of every other language and group. So I think the starting point for rethinking language is for Africans in the whatever units they want to think about how they want to reestablish themselves. And with that at the table, then we'd be able to say, how can we make room for that in a system that's been dominated by inventions, languages, concepts, ideas, knowledge from elsewhere. And with that richness before us, then we would be able to expand what humanity has. We'd be able to solve problems that we can't solve now. We'd be able to understand things that we can't understand now. There's lots of things that Western epistemology doesn't understand. Lots of things that it doesn't do well. So it would enrich the entire world to make space for those traditions and allow the keepers of them to tell us how they want to restore their flame. Thank you for those responses. Um, there is a difficult question I'd like to ask that can be hard to answer. And that question would be, how would we go, if we removed English and we removed colonized languages, how would we go about having a universal language to work in a country like Ghana or Cameroon or Nigeria, where there's quite literally hundreds of ethnic groups and there's hundreds of languages that you could um, work with? So how would we approach that without a colonization or a colonized language? It's difficult. This is it's, it just it is an incredibly difficult project. Uh, in particular, because across countries, even Ghana, which many people don't often look at as a country that has issues in terms of ethnocentrism, it does, right? Um, if there were to be sort of any major proponent for 
a language that would be primary. It would probably be the language languages that Akan people speak, but that's not the majority of the country. And so it, I think like when we talk about these processes, it's so complex um, and it's not simple. I think we want to land on maybe use of one language or two that are dominant throughout a country, but language is deeply tied to culture. And in particular, when there's also been what feels like a larger like ethnic, not colonization, but a clear ethnic division and tensions, thinking through which languages would be best applied would take a lot of work. It would, might look like taking a super local approaches to language policy um, across regions, but who knows how long that would take to implement. We'd also have to think through what's available in terms of the scripts for the language. Um, language learning resources. It's just complex. Um, I think it's a good question and one that we need to like consider and think through, but one that is absolutely going to bring a lot of issues, charge a lot of feelings as well. Um, you'll find even like in student documents from back in the 40s and 50s, they were constantly talking about ethnicity and its role in the nation state and what that would look like for Africans, but it's going to be complex and would also require conversations that we're often not times we're not ready to have we're not oftentimes ready to talk about ethnicity and how that functions across our countries and how some of that is tied to colonialism as well you know um i use ghana i pick on ghana as well because my family is from ghana but like when we look at even educational development the southern region was developed way more and way earlier than the northern region and a lot of that has to do with ethnicity ethnicity and also religion People from the North are typically Muslims, and that bleeds over into educational policy and available of resources to, to date and to present. So it, it's a large, messy, complex conversation that should be had. I think we had Ngugi Watiango and Chino Achebe as, as um, the great sort of literary men of their times leaning into space to have those dialogues, but somehow they feel to have died out in some ways. Um, so definitely something that would take massive planning on the part in particular of government and governance. Yes, thank you for the um, insight because language has been something I've really struggled with when thinking about colonization. It seems that even if we were to remove the European languages, at some level you would have to be forced to create the same dynamic because there's going to be one language that you pick to use the lingua franca, like in the country or with all the documents, or at least even if you boiled it down to a few languages that were supposed to be representative, you'd mm -hmm. still have to recreate some kind of dynamic like that. The only way I can see out of it is maybe if you took an external language or you created a new language that was used as like a common lingua franca, and then everyone retains their native language. But yeah, this is a super complicated issue, but I just wanted to bring up, you know, some of the complexities we face in education, especially when we regard uh, language. Mm -hmm. And anything with education change and reform is just, it's going to take time. And I think that's the other thing as well. We're not even like, we're not even a century out from the colonial period. So this is also something that requires having like a long-term vision and goals, especially for language. It's, it's just messy, but I appreciate the question for sure. Thank you. And Jesse, do you have any comments before we move on to the next question? Yeah, I, my impulse is to complicate the premise. And that is like Africans spoke to each other long before the Europeans. So just ask what they were doing then. In you know, in Europe, if you speak two or three languages, well, okay, great. But Africans often speak six, eight, ten, twelve. I would look at the at the heritage just because I'm curious. Well, Africans spoke European languages before the Europeans colonized. Africans spoke African languages. And your observation about the diversity of languages in Nigeria, well just everything is colonized so i don't know if that unit is even the right one you know I, th like the shape of nigeria you know where that comes from like why is it big and there's so much in there well gambia right is really small 
And that's because the English didn't know the French were coming and they claimed everything around it. That's Senegal. And then they had this warning, right? So the English claimed a little bit more when it got to Sierra Leone. They had more time in Ghana. By the time the French got to Nigeria, the English had expanded. So that's why Nigeria is so much bigger. It's just this happenstance of how the Europeans were squabbling with each other. So who's to say that those are even the right boundaries? I, I wouldn't presume that. No, uh, they're not. I don't think they are. Yeah, I don't think they are. I I agree with you. I also just think it is gonna. It's a massive undertaking. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another one of these in-house issues that outsiders created an incomprehensible, disastrous mess, and. Part of the burden of that is that Africans themselves need to lead the recovery process. They have to figure out their own harm, explain that to themselves, then figure out how to go forward. So they need space, they need resources, and a blank slate to think about it. Yes, thank you for that. Um... We'll go ahead and move on. I just wanted to insert a personal narrative, but I'm from Cameroon and then Hugh is also from Cameroon and we have a big issue that's related to language and the borders that were drawn back during the colonial times. And it's very hard and complicated to think about. And we don't even think about it in terms of indigenous language, but we think about it in terms of European language. Mm -hmm. And I actually personally wanted to learn the language of like my father's family, but there's no resources that exist online. There's no documentation. I would have to probably physically travel to the location and stay there for a significant amount of time if I wanted to learn any, like, kind of take a sincere effort at learning the language. So it's super complicated, and I'm glad we were able to highlight the complexity in it. Mm -hmm. We are doing a little bit over time, so we did kind of discuss the challenges and opportunities of implementing multilingual education as well. So as a conclusion for this session, um, I can ask a question where we can give a couple of brief comments. How can we decolonize pedagogy to make it more inclusive and culturally relevant? Ooh, that's a big question. Mm. We need... Um... Pedagogy is very political is very political and so needing space to really address the politics of pedagogy across different countries and contexts and like a really truthful space bringing together community members, scholars, educators, educationalists like to really speak through and think through what that can look like. There are different efforts that I've seen that have gone into like maybe creating textbooks and sort of like the effort kind of stops from there. But this would have to, it embeds in sort of everything that we've talked about and everything that has to do with decolonization is just long, multi-pronged in need of multiple partners and perspectives in the room across like generations, schools of thought. So we can then produce something and also figure out ways to get input. Of, I would I would really like to figure out ways that we would get public input and perspective and opinion on what best suits the needs in terms of language of instruction, of curriculum, so on and so forth. Like these things are like really sort of transformative, I think, when we think of pedagogy and think of any sort of educational practice. In a lot of ways, formalized educational um, systems are really like rigid and conservative. And so decolonization would require something new, transformative, um, and also a breaking down of different power structures and hierarchies to get to the core of what it is this population, this community, this nation would want. Thank you. I, you know, I, I think the question about decolonizing pedagogy, it's universal. And I'll just speak about how I do it in my classroom. And that is to try to enfranchise as many voices and perspectives as possible on as equal footing as I can. The truth is a four-dimensional object that has to be observed from all the angles. So you have to start with your positionality. Like, 
what is the part that you see? How do you relate to it? And then how do you match somebody else's perspective? You know, you're looking at a different slice of it and then it moves over time. So if you get enough people, then you can understand better. So when you're drawing on information resources, right? Does it have to be a published peer reviewed article? If it is, then that means it's filtered through certain epistemic lenses. I try to bring in different kinds of learning. So, you know, not just written and peer reviewed things by a vast diversity of people, but how about people themselves? Why not, you know, instead of having a book about some group, have that group come in. Let them tell you. Get people you don't understand. Now, there's some limits to that, but, you know, what if you, uh, what if you have a, a healer from another tradition. I do that in my class. We have plenty of allopaths at the Harvard School of Public Health. So bring in a spirit healer. Listen to how she talks about health. And it's not like I use my knowledge just to understand yours. It's like, I got to just understand yours from the inside. When you can get practiced enough to do that, then you can begin decolonizing pedagogy in a new way. It's not easy. Right, you're trying to see the fish tank from inside. It's really hard. So calling on the outside and calling on different perspectives, it begins with understanding where you are and respecting everybody else. I don't know more than my students. I know more about my hometown than they do and the same is true for them. But none of us is better than anybody else. And we need all these perspectives to understand things. So the idea that like one person knows everything and they teach the class in a one-way direction, I mean, that's just wrong. Don't do that. Find as many voices as you can, including the ones in the room. Then try to find ones that aren't there and ask what would happen if they were there. Democratizing knowledge, that's the way forward. Thank you for that. I think that was a great conclusion to this session. So I do want to take a pause real quick. So I'm going to pause. All right. So now we're going to move into session four. So this is about decolonizing institutions and leadership. We have a couple of objectives. So we want to explore the changes needed at the institutional level to decolonize education and then identify strategies for advocating for change within institutions. So the first of the two foundational questions are, what are, what are the changes needed at the institutional level to decolonize education? Whew. I'm going to take a step back and think about that one. I'm deinstitutionalized for a reason. <laughs> oh, Jesse, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I, I'd start by asking, well, what institution are we talking about? And what kind of education is this? It's this really different question from a primary school to a graduate school like mine. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do we need to do here? I guess we could walk through each one of them, so, or maybe that'll take too long, but if we could focus primarily on secondary school, because that seems to be a big focus a lot in education, what could we do in secondary school that, or what, how can, sorry, um, what changes can we do at the institutional level, at least in secondary school, to change education? And then if we have time, we can go back and explore some other levels of analysis. Okay, well, the, just to speak generally about this, and the, the level doesn't matter for this particular comment, but you, you'd you want to democratize hiring. So who's doing the education? You just want to make sure that there is a democratic representation of voices, ideas, identities delivering the education, because that will ensure a diversity or a democracy of ideas. So one place institutionally to be in is hiring. 
And then also institutionally, you'd want to ensure fairness. That's hard to come by. So the selection of candidates, the interview processes, the criteria for promotion, you know, they have biases in them. Are they gendered? Uh, do, do they privilege one kind of perspective over another? It's really hard to understand how far there is to go without starting to think first about what do you want to achieve? What would be the ideal outcome? And that's contextual. So the perfect mix of questions, topics, subjects, methods, teachers in one setting would just be different from another. If you have that contextual picture, then you can design hiring, promotion, retention, training so that it fits that. You can figure out what pieces are there naturally in abundance or just there or which ones need to be go found. Uh, you, you think about that kind of thing institutionally where you're starting with who's there and then who's enfranchised, whose methods, whose ideas, and then sort of toward what ends. You know, there's a limit to how far you want to take contextualization. Mathematics, for example, that's a worldwide tradition. It's been useful. So like the zero, well, that's from India. Geometry, well, that's from the Arab empire. So is algebra. So calculus, European, you start adding these things together and you find there's like, there's this language of mathematics that humanity has been developing. So let's keep going with that. Let's keep putting together, like, you know, Arabic is our, our number system in English anyway, you know, the one, two, three, those are Arabic numerals. And we call them that out of respect for their origin. So there's some areas of education where you might want to change the person who's delivering it and examples that are used and maybe the way it's taught, but maybe the content isn't colonial per se. Maybe in mathematics, for example, you can expand an existing worldwide tradition with more people and more voices. Those are three areas. I, I start with things like that when I think institutional. Absolutely, thank you. And Nana, do you have any comments to add? Oh man, I think I agree with so much of what was said. And then also just, yeah, creating a space for these institutions to also be taken back by the public and being owned by the public and the people. Um, I think, especially when it has to do with education, because of the, the pace and the speed of economics globally that has sort of centered a democratic capitalism. I think that there's a space and time for us to say, we also need these, because these institutions are in the interest of our societies, that these are spaces where we train any and all people, no matter what job or occupation that they take on, there needs to be more space for public accountability as well. Um, and I, I would say this across the globe, really, like not just for Africa, but for anywhere in particular where we've seen um, colonized people and marginalized people uh, making conscious efforts to gain access to these spaces and shift the terrain. I think that's where we also see like examples for strategy in terms of change within and across institutions. Um, once we see those marginalized groups who enter along with the support of those identified allies within those spaces, um, we see a begin or beginning and we can sort of use that as sort of, I think, a, a starting point for moving forward change. Um, but it's it's a really complex, I think, but necessary, necessary step for sure. I do think that sometimes a lot of institutions, especially at the higher education level, they're just too insular. Uh, they're too insular. And I think as we watch now across the United States, where we see a lot of these protests, we're also seeing this push and demand even across protesters. What is the university? What is education? How do we use it for liberation? So. Thank you. And so we'll move on to the next question, which will conclude this uh, session. What strategies can be used to advocate for change within institutions? 
I know Jesse mentioned democratization, for example. So I guess a primer could be, should we have selective admissions um, in education in Africa like we have in the US? Um, how should we hire professors? How should we hire tutors? How should we hire lecturers? How should we decide that students get to attend a particular institution to be educated? And then, of course, if there's any other strategies that exist outside of those. These are great. I think a lot of what you're posing is would be some of the starting point in, in, in addition to what Jesse has shared as well in terms of strategies that could be employed. I really also like the point in discussing and thinking through admissions, in particular for those people who have historically been marginalized from these institutions. That's not really a conversation that I see across Africa. That is something that I would like in particular. I think that's it's important to acknowledge in particular um, the imbalance that exists within the educational terrain already in terms of who can access so what does it mean to purposely recruit and ensure that people across ethnic groups, across gender identities, um, across regions are able to access what we have available to them, I think is absolutely um, a strategy at the government level in particular that should be employed and thought through um, in a way that is indigenous to and honors like the, the context of each nation. But I really enjoy that suggestion. Um, I'm thinking as well, I'm gonna take a, a moment to think a bit through but I, those are just the comments that I have immediately. Yeah, we can we can bounce back to you. I'll, I'll just toss in a couple of things. The question you're asking needs to be uh, addressed at many levels. So, for example, there's the question of what can I do today? It's like, I'm a guy, one guy. What can I do? And that's things like, well, get on the admissions committees. Try to advocate for people who aren't represented for voices that you need. So in my area, which is in, in public health, we're always trying to serve the most marginalized groups, right? We're not about elites because elites take care of themselves. The middle is basically fine. We think about that some, but really what we want are like, how do you get to the most marginalized, the excluded? And you need people from those communities to understand them. Right. It's like if you wanted to understand uh, Ghana in this case, right, you go find some Ghanaians, right? You, you don't you don't want to go to the fanciest, richest place where they have, you know, the most degrees. You, you just go to the source in personal care. Like everybody wants a physician who looks like themselves and has their experiences. It's just easier to relate. So if you're going to do something really intimate like health, and you're trying to meet reach groups that are marginalized, you need to build bridges with them. So hiring, training, recruiting, including from all those communities, that's top priority. And what can I do as just like one guy? Well, get on the admissions committee. Uh, maybe go visit some high schools in my case, because I teach only graduate students, but you know, may maybe colleges or visit a level down and say, to groups that aren't there, maybe you want to come see me. Here's what we're doing. You know, we need you. We need your ideas. And if you try to help people understand their natural advantages, then they feel like they have value. So like when, I, when I'm going to communities like this, I'm not saying I want the people who do the best on the test made by the others. No, I want you because you know this place and no one else does. I want you because you have these experiences and other people don't. So it's like, I want the knowledge. When you democratize the knowledge, then you diversify the people automatically. So thinking like at that individual agent level, anything you can do that helps to democratize, that helps to include groups that aren't there and need to be there, need to be there for epistemic reasons. So, you know, if you have a school that's really narrow and limited, you might only want people from a narrow and limited group or background. But if you're doing something big like international relations, 
health, humanities, science, engineering, you know, anything general, well, you need all kinds of people to help you figure out new ideas, new solutions, how to address unsolved problems. So this kind of democratization, it begins with people and then it will go right into the knowledge system and then it will come out in solutions. So I would just look for any way you could to try to get groups that aren't there and see what they will contribute when they're there, when they're included, when they're appreciated. Yes, thank you for that. And I think that's a good um, altruistic ending to the session. We'll go ahead and move into our last session to conclude up our discussion on decolonizing education. Hey, I don't want to comment on that. Sorry. I oh, no, I think you ended perfectly. Right. Okay. Yes. And so our final session is on reimagining education for the future. So our goals are to identify future trends in education that support the decolonization movement, discuss how innovative approaches can help reimagine education in Africa, and then empower individuals to contribute to the decolonization of education in their communities. Then we'll have some final comments and then we'll conclude the session. So the first foundational comment or question we'll start with of three, or what are some future trends in education that support the decolonization movement? I think there are a few, I think more, so I think um, in this question, I think a bit more about movements. I think of student movements and also movements of disability advocates across the continent. For instance, there's a lot of movement around uh, transforming access and what that looks like across the continent for educational reasons and purposes. And I think that's the questions that they are raising are great. Um, who has access and space to schools across our continent? Um, who has, you know, made been feel to make, who's been made to feel welcome or unwelcome? What are the resources that are need to ensure that, you know, um, students across different backgrounds are successful? I, I find that across the disability rights movement that is sparking and growing, there's a lot of good questions and a lot of um, good interventions that are being thought through and thought of. I also. Um, especially when I think of Southern Africa and I think of the queer students movement um, and how a lot of queer African youth in particular were, were leading a lot of questions around funding of, of education across um, Southern education at Southern African universities. When I think of the um, fees must fall and roads must fall movements and the, uh, the role of youth across different backgrounds as well, sort of teaching us to think through just different conversations amongst ourselves as Africans and as a diaspora, sort of what education can look like if inclusive of all of us. Um, so those are sort of like immediate sort of things and spaces that I think of. Um, also a lot of collaboration across institutions um, that I am really happy to see a lot of growing consortiums as well amongst educators, amongst institutions as well to expand resources and think through different questions. Um, I'm sharing in the chat this summer, there's going to be a summer school across um, that's based at the University of Cape Town that's thinking through the roots of inequality, poverty, and deprivation in Africa and taking on and speaking through like what it means to use our brain power to address these issues as well in the contemporary. So a lot of coalition building that sort of, I think, speaks to the trends of this decolonization movement as well. Th those are great answers. The youth movement, it, it gives me hope too. The activism that we're seeing from our students is tremendous. It's leadership that we have not had from my generation of faculty. I take the, the question to just add a different, different level of the answer. Um, I'd say that the temptation to make this into a technical or a complicated or innovation problem is strong, but a lot of this is simple. The rest of the world needs to say sorry. 
give back resources, pay reparations, leave them alone. And then people will figure it out. It'll take time. There'll be mistakes, but there'll be progress. And eventually people will figure out what they want. So one of the, one of the most important steps is to fix trade policy. You know, just make trade fair. Stop punishing African countries. Stop impoverishing African people. Stop stealing their stuff. So if you just do that, right? I mean, never mind the historical stuff. If you just fix trade policy, you could fix a lot of problems. A lot of the other historic things, they won't resolve themselves, but they could become a lot less important if you had fairness now. Never mind make up for 600 years of harm and destruction. So fix trade policy that gives you the space. You know, education is, it's a soft outcome area. It's a product of all the other resources in society, just like health. You don't sort of make it directly because it depends on road networks. Can your students get to school? It depends on sanitation and hygiene. Like, are there places for girls and women? Are there restrooms? Is it safe? The general economy, can you spare the labor from the fields or wherever factories such that people could get educated? Like that's not education policy. That's like a development question. It's an advancement question. And that makes it a trade policy question. So to, to add to the enthusiasm we have for the youth movements, would to say, be to say that we need to underpin that energy with the enfranchisement, with the economic ability. So with those abilities restored, people are gonna figure it out. But without that, you're not really gonna decolonize because you're not gonna be able to fix these structural economic problems where there just isn't enough money for education. There isn't enough money for people to stay healthy enough so they can go to school. There isn't enough money for people to buy food so they can stop subsistence farming and go into school. So my answer here is going to be trade policy. A hundred percent agree. Really appreciate that response. I agree as well. I think even the trade of educational programs, because we have a lot of educational programs like study abroad that come from the U.S. that come to Africa to do a program. But we also have a lot of brain drains. So African students being recruited to American universities, but you never see kind of the same relationship that American universities have with other places with Africa. So if you look at NYU, they have an NYU Abu Dhabi, they have an NYU Shanghai. Why is there not an NYU Cape Town or why is there not an NYU Lagos or an NYU Accra? So we do need a good fair amount of exchange as well with the educational programs. I do think that the increasing trends in like electrification, people getting smartphone and other kind of technology is useful because that democratizes access to educational materials online. And our next question before we conclude is how can innovative approaches help us reimagine education in Africa? You know, um, Jesse made a point about the language of uh, innovation and how sometimes that can be very problematic. And I, I tend to agree with that. I think liter it is literally um, creating space and providing resources for those ideas created in space to be sort of imagined and then also imp like developed and implemented is the most crucial thing but there i don't think there's any sort of like you know hot sexy this is the way we do it like a lot of this is just going to be like nah we just actually need to get in the room we need to talk we need to talk like engage learn they need to be case studies we need to scale things we need to feel things like it's just like a lot of this is going to be just like standard like getting into the, the, the depths of what has been experienced um, as opposed to like because there's also like there's always been 
thought around this. There have always been ideas. There's a lot that we've seen historically. There are things we see to present. The idea in particular around that was just presented here, um, the use of trade policy and economic policy to fuel and fund and finance, I think is one of the most integral and essential needs that we have more than anything. We need the money. You need the money, schools, learning institutions, facilities, training folks within those spaces, hiring folks to be within those spaces, even those who are maintaining the space. It's all it requires like sustainability. And we just don't have that at the moment. And absolutely then ties into reparations because those reparations are absolutely owed and necessary. And in particular, when we think of like what has clearly been documented, a clear we're doing this for these purposes to underdevelop, to harm, to traumatize, and to completely offset. Like, this is, it's just old at this, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's the most, I mean, innovative that I could think of. Like, give us the money, give us the space, give us the time. Amen. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, the inno innovation is the ultimate self deception of the West. It's this idea that Africa is this puzzle that somehow people haven't figured it out yet. And if we put our smartest people and our most liberal activists to it, oh, they're going to get it this time. That's just a lie. Fact is, innovation is justice. Innovation is reparations. That's an innovation. Innovation is Africans being left alone, given the autonomy that they deserve, afforded the independence, recognized for their richness, for their ingenuity, for their culture, for their contribution, for their humanity. Like we all come from there. We owe our lives to Africa. All of us do, everyone, everywhere. And so to think about innovation is a distraction from these so basic issues. The basic issue is historical and ongoing harm. It's not innovation. So, you know, don't go give me a hackathon. That's not going to cut it. It's not going to work. It's just going to distract people from the harms that are ongoing. So we need to just kind of slow that down and call innovation what it really, really is. And that is justice. That's what we need. Amen to that 100%. Um, I appreciate both of your responses. It seems as if we position the traditional thoughts of innovation as kind of a manufactured paralysis by analysis where we just keep in this ongoing cycle of thinking it's a magic answer, but there's not. And so for the last question of the last session, um, what can individuals do to contribute to the decolonization of education in their own communities? Could you maybe give us some guidance about what sort of communities or individuals we're thinking about here? Um, we could think of it as, um, let's say we have a student who lives in Luanda, Angola, and they want to improve education within their community. How could they go about approaching that? I think one way we've actually done it with each other, we've made sure that we're equitable in making sure we all have time to speak. We're equitable in making sure we're not having any kind of disparity between us. That could be an example of a strategy, for example. Okay. Nana, do you, do you mind if I address that for a moment? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Look, if I'm talking to a student in Angola, what I'm going to say is they're right. They know. They have knowledge. They have dignity. And they shouldn't be listening to me. What they know about their country, about their culture, about their experiences, Westerners have been telling them they're wrong, that they don't know it, that they're inadequate. And they just got, they just can't believe that. They need to rely on themselves to know that they're right. In their hearts and their minds, they know what the truth is. They just have to believe it. And then strengthen that belief. 
to say that we as Angolans, we know what's best for us. We know what we want. Angola was one of the uh, favorite destinations for some of the slave traders because the Africans there were really strong and they worked harder. So that Central Africa, the Congo, the Cuba tribe, that whole area was just targeted by slave raiders. Imagine what that does to a community. The ideas, the waste of humanity, the killing, the destruction, genocide in next door in Namibia, all of it. So the first thing you have to tell our students in Angola, in Namibia, throughout Africa, is that their experience is the truth. And they know it. They need to believe it. We need to affirm their belief in it. And then we need to believe that too. So they shouldn't go think about the next best solution or a fancy textbook or protractors or equipment. What they need to do is look at themselves and say, we are the knowledge. We know it's right. And we're going to figure out our way forward. Agreed. Agreed. Continue doing what's been done. There are so many examples. I think that, and I think individuals, I think communities do see that. I think youth see that, especially those who are motivated to do something different and they find each other. Um, so I think one thing that I would add as well, when you have these thoughts, because I think across societies, I think any of us here, like us, even in this conversation, there was there were these integral points where we started asking questions um, pursuing the answers to those questions and then finding community to sort of expand on those questions and thoughts with. I think that's integral to ensure that you find your people as you're, you know, doing this work and as you're thinking through what is, you know, a life like lifetimes like project, I think for me, that decolonization, both personally, politically, and in any other aspects. Thank you. That was um, beautifully put. And so we have about three minutes left. Um, are there any final concluding remarks either of you'd like to add before we finish up? It was a wonderful discussion and we got through a lot. So five different sessions, five topics is amazing within decolonizing education. Yeah, just thank you for the opportunity. Thank It was great, you know, speaking and learning and engaging. It was just a great opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I join Nana in expressing thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to learn and discuss with all of you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address these topics. And I'd like to conclude by, by saying again that the respect we can have for each other is the basis of everything. That will lead you to justice. It will lead you to what's right. And it needs to start now. Yes, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure moderating this discussion, and it's great to have two esteemed guests. Thank you for your contributions to the webinar or to the panel discussion, and um, we all look forward to following your research. Um, thank you, Dr. Nana, for sharing the resources as well, so everyone has access to be able to go and learn more from specific text about decolonization and education in Africa. Thank you. Have a good one.